Hello, I am Joanne Gear. I'm the executive director for the Westchester Biotech Project. We are a almost five-year-old organization focused on bringing together researchers, data scientists, and engineers. And our program today is part of our consortium on translational research in the microbiome, which is a collaboration with a number of partners we'll, you'll get to know very shortly. Would you go to the next slide, please? Uh, today, we're going to hear from the co-chairs of the consortium. It's Keith Bastian from the Institute for Life Science Entrepreneurship, Richard Theron from Cernios Group, and Adela Bonneau from Catina Biologics. Next slide, please. And our speakers today will be Nikki Shaltuck and Dr. David Hahn, both from the Intercell Research Group. Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, major programs that we run at Westchester Biotech Project fall into actually more legs than these, but these are the big ones. So we do a career consortium, which really looks at the entire flow from very young kids through PhD postdocs building careers and the Amanoskri's uh, maintaining a science career. It's a really powerful, uh, an important part of our work and where we feel that we can make a contribution because we don't want any uh, people who should be engaged in the sciences to be left on the sidelines. Our data hub is in the bit in launch mode for a while and it's all about bringing together our various groups of constituents but especially data scientists from discovery to preclinical to clinical to patient care to population health and addressing the, some of the regulatory issues and, and of course the AI and machine learning issues to look across that kind of data. To go on to the next slide, please. We have a number of wonderful partners. ILSA is fantastic. Montero Language Services is a uh, uh, Madrid-based company that focuses on clinical research documents, intellectual property, and so on. Uh, and we like to partner, so if it intrigues you, please be in touch. Would you go on to the next slide, please? I'm gonna turn it over to Richard Theron and take it away, Richard. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Westchester Biotech Project, a CTRM on microbiome research uh, with the, the Cernios group. And I'd like to uh, welcome um, Nikki Scholtek and Dr. David Hahn of the Intracell uh, Research Group. Uh, Nikki is the author of a recent op-ed, How COVID-19 Can Break Barriers F Facing the Alzheimer Germ Theory. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce Dr. Keith Bostian, you know, founder and CEO of the Institute for Life Science in Entrepreneurship you know, of New Jersey, Dr. Bastian. Keith, you're still muted. Well, I've done enough calls, I should know that that uh, a novice's mistake there, but I just wanted to say that I'll keep my comments brief. I've already not done that, but uh, I wanna extend Joanne's uh, welcome to everyone and your participation today. A um, couple of things I'd like to just mention. One, um, we are planning to have an in-person uh, symposium on the topic of uh, advancing microbiome science to clinical practice, particularly with regard to uh, the uh, more downstream efforts of uh, development and, and commercialization and scale up. Uh, we don't have an exact date yet, but it would be here uh, at the Institute, which is on the campus of Keene University, quite close to, uh, to Newark Airport. So just to give you a heads up on that, uh, if and when it happens uh, in the near term, probably be uh, beginning of next year. But the other point I wanted to make is that we began forming this consortium uh, along with the pandemic interruption to really address some of the issues and uh, problems associated with uh, translating uh, microbiome science uh, into uh, commercial opportunities and commercial products. And we just felt that having a working group of scientists that were sharing their uh, trials and tribulations and successes 
in a, a sort of open framework structure like this and to support networking and interactions and sharing of information or strategies would be helpful for advancing uh, the field. And of course, it's grown considerably just in the last two or three years with products now for human health, for example, in a, in a uh, microbial products uh, going well into the clinic and in many other industries and uh, sectors and areas as well. So we've not been able to do quite as much as we wanted to through these webinars, but we decided, uh, um, I guess it was late last year, that we would continue on virtually through these webinars and maintain an interested audience for a period of time and then shift into uh, you know, a more real in-person mode. So that's where we are today. Stay tuned with regard to our meeting. Uh, and uh, I think uh, you know, uh, uh, a surge in activity for the consortium. And if you have any colleagues or people that you think we should invite to join us even now, please uh, you know, let Richard, Joanne, or I know, and we'll be happy to include them in the invitation list. And I uh, just will say, finally, I'm really looking forward to today's presentations and to hearing from everyone on, on the call. Thank you. Wonderful, Keith, thank you so much. Richard, Joanne, Adela, thank you, Matthew, for your tech support and to the Westchester Biotech Project for inviting us here today. David and I are incredibly grateful for this opportunity. I'll go ahead and uh, so um, I'm Nikki Scholtek, as they mentioned, and I'm the founder of Intracell Research Group. We are a global consortium uh, trying to clarify essentially the role of chronic infection in human diseases. And today I'm gonna to talk about bridging the silos to clarify the role of infection in chronic diseases. So in order to really talk about what Intracell Research Group is, I have to talk about why it is and why it began. And I was actually a patient um, and my journey with my own chronic health issues is what led to the creation of this consortium. And I decided to share a quote with all of you from one of my favorite books. Um, I saw it in the book, The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. And it's this Susan Sontag quote that really grabbed me in my experience. And it is that everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well, in the kingdom of the sick. Although we all prefer to use the good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as a citizen, as citizens of that other place. My time spent in the other place has led me to where I am today. And essentially, uh, roughly six years ago, I became what nobody wants to be, which is the N of one. I developed multiple uh, autoimmune conditions and idiopathic conditions over the course of a year that really robbed me of my ability to be present with my two young children um, and really scared me and, and made me feel that I was in jeopardy of losing my life. I had lifelong asthma, but it was reasonably controlled uh, when inhaled corticosteroids came to market. However, all of a sudden something changed. I developed persistent shortness of breath and lung inflammation that was refractory to all of the treatments my asthma specialist was offering, including high dose prednisone. At the same time, I also was experiencing new onset joint pain and swelling, chronic bladder pain, and finally neurologic symptoms. And again, um, any one of these things by themselves can be debilitating, but at this point I was suffering with all of them. So when you get sick like this, you become what I like to call the human hockey puck. And it's not a good feeling. You get like a hockey puck pushed from one player to the next. So this is the list of specialists I had. Uh, every single specialist, what I noticed was that they were dealing with their specific part of the body, not really thinking about my case as a big picture. Um, so the lung doctor looking at the lungs, the gynecologist and neurologist looking at the bladder, neurologist talking about my neurodegenerative symptoms, GI talking about my guts, ENT thinking about my throat and nose, and uh, really ultimately no one was thinking collaboratively to try to decide why a young, healthy person that was running half marathons, ate healthy food, never smoked, took good care of herself, would suddenly go down the tubes like this over the course of a year. So there was one thing that my diseases had in common that I was aware of at the time, and it was that they were all idiopathic. And this is how you feel about it when it's you. 
it's not good when you're the one who has these diseases and what you're being offered is uh, benzodiazepines like Xanax to calm your nerves uh, from the ear, nose, throat doctor that doesn't know why you're as sick as you are, or um, amitriptyline for your bladder pain, which is an old tricyclic antidepressant um, that would simply cover up the symptoms but not really address the root cause. I was really curious why I would be so sick uh, systemically. So then that left me with two really big questions. What else do my conditions have in common? Number one, no one could answer that question. Number two, what could cause such a sudden change in health and result in systemic inflammation? Because really when I looked at all the different things that were going on, they were all related to inflammation and many idiopathic diseases are. So for a period of weeks following my diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, um, which for anyone that isn't that familiar with that disease, people that suffer from it, it's, it's debilitating. It's considered to be one of the top 10 most painful things a person can have. People with the disease sometimes visit the bathroom 70 times a day, and that includes overnight when you're trying to do things like sleep. Um, it can pretty much ruin your life. So that diagnosis pretty much shook me to my core, leaving me with pretty much a constant state of panic for a few weeks where I shut down. But then finally, I said to myself that if I didn't start to empower uh, myself and learn about what was going on and dig a bit deeper on my own case, that no one else would, number one. And number two, that I'm the owner of my body. And I decided to begin to take control by doing research. So I decided to Google two of my diagnoses, interstitial cystitis, the bladder pain condition. And one of the things I was diagnosed with while I was having such a horrific time breathing, atypical pneumonia. And this Google search changed the rest of my entire life. I came up with this. So this was a small study uh, done in 2001 down at Vanderbilt involving a infectious disease specialist slash medical microbiologist and a, urine, a urologist looking at a small subset of patients with interstitial cystitis, uh, examining the lining of their bladder. So if you take someone with IC and you check their urine and a urinalysis typically doesn't reveal bacteria. Um, which is a scary thing, right? You have all of the pain of a urinary tract infection or a bladder infection, but they don't find anything. Well, in this cohort, 81% uh, of the women with interstitial cystitis had intracellular chlamydia pneumoniae. Now, you don't have to get all awkward and jump off the Zoom meeting. It's not the STD chlamydia. It's the respiratory form of the organism. A lot of people don't even know that it exists, even though roughly 80% of the adult population has been infected with it. So it's an intracellular bacterium that invades cells, uh, can travel anywhere in the body by entering immune cells, and can actually elicit a state of low-grade chronic inflammation. And this has been demonstrated in the literature. So at this point, I'm feeling curious, right? Could I have an infection in the lining of my bladder that's driving this? So now I'm really curious about the other conditions. So this is what a 2021 Google search looks like of chlamydia, pneumonia, and asthma. I searched it back uh, at the beginning of, of this illness and at the same time as I looked up the association between uh, interstitial cystitis and atypical pneumonia. And it really was sort of like getting hit upside the head with a baseball bat. And I was curious, you know, I've had asthma literally my entire life from the time I was a small child. Uh, is this organism involved in that disease too? And what I found is that there is a wealth of data associating chlamydia pneumoniae and another pathogen that resides in the lung and the respiratory tract, mycoplasma pneumoniae. These pathogens can become chronic and oftentimes do. They can also elicit the characteristic airway inflammation and hyperreactivity seen in asthma. And this is documented. So while I feel at the same time shocked, I'm also feeling a little bit angry that I didn't know this and a little disappointed in myself uh, having come from a previous career working for Pfizer and Genentech and loving to read the literature, that I didn't really think deeply about the concept of autoimmunity. And, uh, and really at this point in time, everything feels like it's turned upside down because I'm questioning you know, the, the possibility that certain autoimmune diseases like my asthma, like my interstitial cystitis, could in fact be driven by stealth pathogens that aren't easily identified with typical testing methods. So 
I ended up finding an answer, which a lot of people aren't that fortunate. I started to email the physicians and researchers that were publishing these papers. David, who you'll hear from next, is one of them, one of the first people I wrote. Uh, they actually answered. I was shocked. I figured they think I was, um, you know, totally bonkers writing my whole medical history out in an email. Uh, a board certified infectious disease specialist and global chlamydia pneumonia expert recommended some testing for me. That's pretty easy to run blood tests. And ultimately, in my case, several stealth pathogens were present. These are things that can become chronic. So I did indeed have chlamydia pneumonia, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the uh, bacterial infection that causes what everyone commonly known is known as Lyme disease, mycoplasma pneumonia, and human herpes virus 6. Very reluctantly, I started a combination of antibiotics prescribed by an infectious disease specialist, not dissimilar to the type of regimen that would be used to treat tuberculous meningitis. And I'll say that I was reluctant because in my time in industry, I helped launch an antibiotic at Pfizer and had attended ID grand rounds and knew very well that antibiotics come with risks. And those risks truly concerned me. Uh, issues of resistance, uh, C. difficile, um, you know, but the truth of the matter was in treating any disease, you have to weigh the risks of the disease that those impose versus the risk of the treatment. And in my case, what I was experiencing, especially by way of neurodegenerative symptoms at my age, which was the early 30s, were truly uh, disturbing. So I began the therapy. The therapy put my diseases into remission. And this was something that I didn't expect. But with the wellness came a flood of questions and mission, essentially. Because for me to simply be well, I'm thankful for it. Uh, I look at my two children, I get to watch them grow. They don't have to have their mom lying on the couch with the heating pad wrapped around her waist or spending the entire day in the bathroom or awake all night hitched up to a nebulizer. Um, I wonder how many other people are like me. So I have this painful sense of obligation, I'll call it. It keeps me awake at night. And these are some of the questions that drive me and that drive Intracell Research Group. Which microbes become chronic and cause inflammation? What genetic and environmental traits predispose certain individuals to illness from common germs? Because clearly not all of us get sick from certain infections. What other effect might antimicrobials confer? Through my research and time spent studying, I know that the drugs that I was prescribed to treat me also have things called pleiotropic effects, which explain their effects that are aside from the primary goal, which is to eradicate pathogens. Some of the antibiotics are anti-inflammatory on their own. They affect mitochondrial function, for example. So a lot of great scientific questions to come from my case. Uh, also, can the pathobiome or microbiome be modified to prevent or modify disease progression? This is a really important question, especially around some of the diseases where there's a great deal of evidence implicating that microbes are important, like Alzheimer's and asthma. So what now? So what do we know? We know that germs can cause chronic diseases and can cause disease in general. Let's take the example of Helicobacter pylori, the sneaky little gut bacterium that evaded everyone's radar for over a decade and causes ulcers and GI cancers. We know that human papillomavirus causes cervical cancer and now we attempt to vaccinate all children to prevent this from happening as well as cancers of the throat and other areas of the body. We know now that certain patients that contract SARS-CoV-2 will go on to develop long haul symptoms of various parts of the body. Um, so I put up this little cartoon to sort of demonstrate, which is just a part of the truth, is that anything that questions the foundation of medicine is difficult. You know, so, so here's the image of, of the little guy chiseling away to make a round wheel to make work easier and then the mom telling them, just drag the rocks up the hill like we used to. So what we're hoping is that people, you know, come away from today thinking a bit differently about moving things up the hill. So intracell, this consortium approach, essentially what we're trying to do is bridge silos. One of the toughest things about demonstrating that microbes are involved in a disease is the fact that the groups studying the microbes and the diseases are completely separate. We have a siloed approach. Let's take the Alzheimer's or neurodegeneration example. Created this little flowchart here on the left, demonstrating what 
would be ideal to help clarify some of the hypotheses around germs and Alzheimer's would be to link immunology, infectious diseases, microbiology, neurology, and psychiatry. Typically the last two, neurology and psychiatry, are the ones dealing with research and seeing the patients. But there's a lot to be learned by these collaborative approaches. And that is what we are building with Intracell. And thanks to my husband, I was able to capture this picture on the right-hand side um, with these silos in town creeping around a construction site early in the morning. But I was, uh, I was really grabbed by this notion of, you know, uh, bringing people together. And I wondered if in my own case, if some of the physicians I had seen had talked amongst themselves, would they have come to the concept that eventually ended up uh, in a proper diagnosis for me and a proper treatment? So our focus, we are focused on Alzheimer's disease and asthma. And there are two great reasons, evidence and need. In both of those diseases, there is a body of cred credible evidence indicating that chronic infection is important and that the microbiome or pathobiome, which are our deleterious passengers, is important. And then the need. Um, we are connecting smart people globally. Bringing people together results in new ideas and pathways no one would have ever imagined. But it's very hard for researchers to talk to one another because time is a major constraint. So I help to devise and build research collaborations that otherwise might not be possible. We're publishing together. We're involving and partnering with industry and advocacy groups. And we're spurring the development of new intellectual property, everything from diagnostics, preventatives to treatments. And then finally, and really importantly, we're raising awareness about this issue to help increase the funding that's available to do critical work and answer some of those research questions. And I wanna say that our consortium model works. You know, when I started Intracell formally four years ago, I had absolutely no idea to be truthful what I was going to do, just that there was this huge need and this elephant in the corner of the room and I didn't know exactly what the answer would be. Well, I just started introducing people to each other and now what it has resulted in um, was in June, we published a case series. It was uh, basically proof that this idea works of connecting a group of individuals that may not otherwise be involved with each other in a collaboration. And we published the results of combination antibiotics in severe asthma and overlap syndrome. Now this group of patients is incredibly important because number one, uh, I had severe refractory asthma and I know what it feels like and was treated with combination antibiotics successfully. Number two, these patients are frequently omitted from research because they're not pure asthma patients. These are people that have had asthma that's so severe for so long that their lungs are damaged and they now have COPD. So they're an underserved group of individuals that we were able to demonstrate can possibly benefit from antimicrobial therapy. We are now applying this model for Alzheimer's disease. And why? There's a tremendous need. Alzheimer's is a global pandemic. We still know that there is really no effective, precise treatment available for these patients. There is evidence strongly implicating infectious diseases. And proof of concept in Alzheimer's will lead to innovation in other neurodegenerative diseases. These are horrible conditions. So we invite you for two things, um, collaborate with us, reach out. I am building these uh, groups around the globe, connecting people to one another, every day learning and growing, and it's tremendously important. And I encourage everyone today that listened to think about this quote by Arthur Schopenhauer, and it's that all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, it's accepted as being self-evident. I've provided my email here and uh, look forward to having the chance to engage with everyone after all the presentations are over. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Hahn of the Intracell Research Group, who will now talk about uh, chlamydia, pneumonia, and asthma. Uh, uh, Dr. Hahn is a well-published um, medical scientist and author, and I'd like to um, invite him to present uh, his research. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, before I begin, I, Nikki wanted me to s say a few words about my personal situation. Uh, I think it exemplifies the idea of uh, a holism in research. I, uh, I was trained as a family physician. That was my entire career. <clears throat> but I also had an avocation and interest in research, which I conducted throughout my 35 years of practice. Uh, and because of my research interests, I got advanced training 
with a degree in epidemiology, advanced training in medical microbiology, and immunology, clinical trial design, uh, and uh, so forth. So that all uh, um, was a requirement for uh, the study of chlamydia, pneumonia, and asthma, which I stumbled upon during, uh, during my interest in infectious disease. Uh, so I'm going to give you uh, about a 10, 10 minute overview from 30,000 feet, uh, a very broad look at chlamydia pneumoniae and asthma. Now chlamydia pneumoniae is an obligate intracellular pathogen that's an established cause for uh, acute respiratory illnesses like bronchitis and community acquired pneumonia. And it causes a protean manifestation of respiratory illnesses and indistinguishable from viruses. All chlamydia organisms are notorious for causing chronic uh, infections and immunopathologic damage in target organs. And uh, this uh, applies to uh, the target organ of the lung and asthma. But also because uh, chlamydia pneumoniae can disseminate via monocytes to virtually every organ in the human body, uh, it is suspected of uh, being involved in a wide variety of chronic inflammatory diseases of unknown etiology, and not only asthma, but also um, uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, and um, arthritis uh, diseases, reactive arthritis. <clears throat> Chlamydia pneumonia antibodies begin to appear in the population around age school uh, entry at, L at age five. And by the age of 20 to 30, over half the population worldwide has antibodies. And by the age of 80 or 90, about 80 to 90% of people have antibodies, which is unusual in that most acute uh, chlamydial infections develop antibodies that wane after two to three years. So this is strong evidence that either reinfections or chronic infections may be common. This idea is supported by the fact that up to 40% of healthy blood donors have the organism circulating in their immune cells by PCR. So chlamydia pneumonia could conceivably be considered part of the human microbiome, even though it's actually an intracellular pathogen, interestingly enough. Asthma uh, is the most common morbid disease of children and uh, is also very common in adults. Actually, adult onset asthma prevalence is greater than uh, the prevalence of childhood asthma. Uh, in adulthood uh, due to its uh, uh, the adult onset asthma tends to worsen whereas child uh, disease tends to improve over a lifetime. And there are many more years to accrue adult cases than uh, childhood cases. The, the current concept of asthma is of a non-infectious uh, disease whose root cause is inflammation. Hence, anti-inflammatories are uh, key to treatment these days, and uh, most research is aimed at uh, identifying new targets to create uh, anti-inflammatory molecules against, such as monoclonals. But uh, there is, uh, there is, uh, oh, there we go. There is. Uh, a large body of evidence associating chlamydia pneumoniae biomarkers with asthma. Um, these are a list of the studies that I performed and many others around the world uh, likewise have done similar studies that are mostly uh, consistent with this idea that infection may play a role in asthma. Uh, you, heard of, you heard Nikki's case report uh, published case series and case control studies in which 
the associations uh, are actually quite strong. Sometimes the odds ratios exceed 10 in some of these primary care studies. We've done prospective clinical and microbiologic studies, and then a series of treatment trials before, after treatment and open label uh, uh, and randomized controlled trials, all of which show positive signals, but none of which were well enough funded to be definitive. Fortunately, uh, a large study uh, called AMAZES has emerged from Australia, and this has significantly uh, impacted the uh, guidelines, as I'll mention in a moment. Uh, I don't know why this isn't advancing. Uh, let me try it down here. There we go. Regarding the strength of the association, this uh, is a forest plot from a recent meta-analysis of the population attributable risk uh, of chlamydia pneumonia, specific IgE in chronic asthma. Population attributable risk is an epidemiologic construct that uh, measures the proportion of the disease under study that is potential, potentially associated with the risk factor. And in this case, the result was that almost half of the chronic asthma studied could be attributable to the presence of a specific IgE antibody to chlamydia pneumoniae. IgE is the allergic antibody that is pretty well accepted as a key underlying part of the pathophysiology of asthma, both in children and adults. In children, many, the source of the IgE in many cases is environmental, uh, as evidenced by positive skin tests for things like ragweed, dust, mites, etc. Traditionally, adult onset asthma was considered non-atopic because the, uh, of the absence of positive skin tests in many cases, but the epidemiology suggests that IgE nonetheless is associated with asthma in adulthood. So this raises the question, could there be the hidden antigens, uh, possibly even uh, from a deep lung infection by intracellular pathogens that could be creating the IgE that is then pathogenetic in asthma? So this is a area that needs further ex exploration. As you can see, there are only three studies here, uh, plus an additional one in acute asthma that also showed an even stronger population attributable risk. Another find from the, a meta-analysis is that the more severe asthma, the stronger the association with uh, the chlamydia pneumoniae biomarkers, not just IgE, but also IgA and IgE, IgG in both children and adults. This uh, forest plot uh, presents subgroup results for mild, moderate, and severe disease. Uh, some studies use this different severity category, controlled, partly controlled, and uncontrolled, and these were concatenated in this analysis. And as you can see, the uh, associations strengthened with the severity of the disease. Uh, there was even a very tiny possible association with very mild disease, but um, not, not really striking. Moderate and partly controlled disease had a larger 28% uh, attributable risk and severe disease a 39% attributable risk for all antibodies combined. So again, this uh, suggests further work. Uh, especially focusing on the more severe forms of the disease. Uh, you've probably all heard of the 80-20 rule. 80% uh, of the morbidity and mortality is usually attributable to 20% of the disease. That's probably true in asthma. Oh, let's see here, let's do this. Now coming at uh, the elephant from the other direction, it's now established that azithromycin Macrolide antibiotic is efficacious in severe refractory asthma. And in fact, all the major 
asthma guidelines now list azithromycin as a treatment option for severe refractory asthma, but the mechanisms of action are not known. If you ask most pulmonologists or allergists their opinion, they would tell you that macrolides like azithromycin are anti-inflammatory. Unfortunately, none of the studies done to date except my own have been designed to try to tease apart the uh, different possible mechanisms, antimicrobial versus anti-inflammatory. Uh, one one uh, lacking uh, design characteristic is no post-treatment observation trials to determine whether effects wane or persist after treatment. Uh, as Nikki implied, there were no there are no studies, uh, no well-funded studies of less severe asthma or what we call difficult to treat asthma, which is very severe or uncontrolled asthma that may not be refractory, other than the patient may be refractory to taking treatment. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the asthma COPD overlap syndrome is understudied. Currently, most experts believe and studies are designed to separate asthma and COPD as completely distinct and different diseases that need to be studied separately, despite all the clinical and epidemiologic evidence that they are part of the same spectrum of uh, disease that the Dutch call chronic nonspecific lung disease. Um, furthermore, there are no trials of double therapy in asthma. Uh, now, uh, analogies to uh, chlamydia-associated arthritis trials suggest that a double therapy with either a macrolide or a tetracycline plus rifampin may be more efficacious. They are more efficacious in chlamydia trachomatis and tr chlamydia pneumoniae-associated arthritis. And uh, lastly, or it's very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, make a microbiologic diagnosis in, a, uh, in chronic asthma. There are no defined serologic criteria for chronic infection. Uh, the antibodies can be suggestive, but not definitive. And uh, sampling is very difficult. So I, my final slide, uh, I'm just going to mention the, what I call chlamydia phobia just made that up for this presentation, defined as reluctance to acknowledge chlamydia pneumonia as a potential causal agent in asthma and other diseases for that matter. There are lots of technical reasons why it's very difficult to study and make definitive uh, answers. Sparse infective burden is very likely. Uh, there are uh, animal models showing that uh, infection of mice with a respiratory chlamydia pneumonia can cause the asthma phenotype and that adoptive transfer of just lung dendritic cells from infected animals with asthma will recreate the asthma phenotype in recipients, suggesting that sparse infection of a single key immunologic regulator in the lung may be all that's necessary to create the disease. Uh, it's easy to sample lungs of mice, but uh, I have yet to find a patient willing to donate a lung for science. And it's very difficult to sample deep lung tissue in human studies. Uh, so bio, biomarkers, uh, peripheral biomarkers seem to be the only samples that are really available practically currently. And lastly, um, there are no clinical diagnostic tests uh, really that are FDA approved for PCR. And uh, even if you could get a sample, uh, you can't get tested. And the, the, there's only a few uh, expert labs around the world who have uh, current uh, adequate techniques and sensitivity and specificity to handle these samples. But lastly, and I think very importantly, the power of dogma still uh, is a, a big barrier to doing research in this area. And I'm gonna stop here and um, leave it open for questions.